Almost everything you know about millennials and Gen Z is wrong. Have you ever wondered why millennials are lazy, entitled narcissists that are still living with their parents? Or why Gen Z using TikTok is going to be the end of Google? Have you ever wondered if it's, as you've been told, eating avocado toast that's keeping millennials from being able to afford a home? Newsflash, at once a week, the 2016 Australian avocado toast at $22, it would still take you 175 years to have the right amount for deposit on a Sydney home. To save for deposit in a reasonable time, let's say 10 years, you would need to eat avocado toast 17 or 18 times a week and cut that. Even if you love avocado toast, that's hardcore. That means there's about three meals every week that are not avocado toast. The discourse on generations is everywhere. For example, you are being told that millennials are a growing electoral force, or you're being told that Gen Z are massively into urban fishing, whatever that might be. I'm not eating anything that comes out of the Thames. YouTube is also full of generation stuff. A study showed that while only 4% of millennials and older generations believe 13 is an okay age for owning a smartphone, as high as 18% of Generation Z members think it is an okay age. That video I just showed you a clip from is almost entirely about age differences that are being passed as generational differences. Welcome back to that. You also have your usual suspect, for example, Simon Sinek. And so you have an entire generation that's growing up with lower self-esteem than previous generations. Like, look at some data to see if that's true. For example, this paper finds no difference in self-esteem across cohorts. Age, gender, education, race, all of this had an effect. Generation, none. I am kind of resenting that I had to watch the full video in preparation for this. Sinek is a repeat offender. He was bad-mouthing millennials a few years ago, and now he's back at it with Gen Z. This young generation seems less capable to deal with stress than previous generations. That is true. Even one of my favorite comedy YouTube channel is full of it. But at least these guys are funny. And I could go on and on and on. This was fun, but it's mostly old people being mad at being less young than younger people. Do we have any evidence of real impact of generational labels beyond the price and pop culture. It seems that we do, because companies are also very worried about millennials and Gen Z. Businesses are worried about generations in at least two ways. First, they're wondering how to sell them stuff. Second, they're wondering how to deal with them as employees. For example, marketers wonder how to reach millennials or worse, they hire Gen Z brand whisperers. What new generation means for the workplace features heavily. For example, are Gen Z disrupting the definition of a prestigious job? Or whether dealing with generational cohort at work requires subtlety? One thing that becomes obvious when you do a bit of research about millennials and Gen Z is that headlines that a few years ago were about millennials are now being recycled to be about Gen Z. The Simon Sinek clips from earlier are an example of that. I could go on and on, but you're getting the point. The discourse about generations is ever-present in the popular imagination. Those questions are questions you see often in the popular press. And on the surface, they seem like interesting questions. But are they really? In the rest of the video, I will argue that those are the wrong questions to ask. And I will try to suggest better questions Hi, I'm Antoine Vernet, and in this video about generations, I'm going to give you tools to decide how much you should trust the content that you see that's talking about generations. So before we continue, let's take a step back and think about how we define generations. How we constitute those as categories is an important part of how we're going to be able to study them. This is an important part of data literacy, taking a step back and thinking carefully about what is it that we're studying? Often, that allows us to do a reality check and figure out maybe why 
we might find strange results in what we study. For example, that's what Tim Arford described in his rule four in his book, How to Make the World Add Up, 10 rules for thinking differently about numbers. This is also an argument about how social objects are constructed that someone like Owen Becker makes in his book, Evidence. So let's have a go at a definition. The Pew Research Center is an organization that has done a lot of work on generations and especially they've tried to use the concept of generation to talk about change in society. For example, they use data to come up with general facts about millennials. They did this in 2017 and came up with five facts. Fact number one, more millennial households in poverty than households headed by any other generation. Second, millennial households are overrepresented among renters. Third, over half of cohabiting couples are headed by a millennial. Fourth, in 2016, millennials surpassed all other generations in number of household heads who were single mothers. And fifth, among household heads, the millennials are the generation with the largest number identifying as multiracial. We will revisit these five facts later in the video. The Pew Research Center suggests that generations are a tool to understand our views change over time. It's also a way to study how formative experiences interact with the life cycle and the aging process in order to shape people's views. This is all well and good in an attractive proposition. Understanding how society changes by looking at groups of people born at different time and how they differ from each other. For a while, the Pew Research Center defined millennials as anyone born between 1981 and 1997. They then revised that upper limit to 1996 and anyone born between 1997 and 2012 became part of a new generation that is now called Gen Z. The names of generations are often unimaginative. Gen X was followed by Gen Y, which are the people that we know now as millennials, and then Gen Z. And for now, people that have been born after 2012 are known as Generation Alpha. The center argues that while generational boundaries are not an exact science, they're also not arbitrary. But what I want you to note is that if those boundaries are flexible, that might be a sign that our definition is a bit less robust than we might want it to be. Generations are categories, and categories are a very useful tool to help us understand the world around us and categorize it to make sense of it. For example, categories allow us to group objects or people under a single label that comes with the assumption that there is some sort of homogeneity within that group. Really though, why categories are important and interesting should be the subject of another video. The Pew Research Center uses a range of different indicators to delimit generations. For example, baby boomers are defined by demography. There was a huge increase in birth after the Second World War. But as we will see later, this is not the case in every country and not to the same extent. So for example, baby boomers are much more obviously a demographic event in the US than they are in the UK. An example of an homogeneity claim that's often made about millennials is the idea that they've been shaped by 9-11 and by the 2008 financial crisis. But in 9-11, the oldest millennial were about 20, when the youngest one were only five. And during the 2008 crisis, the youngest one were 12, and the oldest one were 27. Another example of a claim of homogeneity is calling Gen Z digital natives, as if all of them had grown up with access to digital technology, when we know that digital technology access is not homogeneous. Of course, it varies across different countries, but it also varies within a country between the richest and the poorest in a country. So it does not seem obvious that millennials and Gen Z fulfill either of the two criteria that we've discussed. On the other hand, boomers are a real demographic event. 
They're also the only generation that's officially defined by the US Census Bureau. So what are we really talking about when we talk about generations? So the whole idea of generation is based around the idea that there is something called cohort effect. And what those are is effects that affect a whole cohort. But those need to be distinguished from age and period effect. Age effects are fairly obvious. They link to the age of the people that are being studied. And period effects are effects that are linked to actual events that are taking place in a specific period. For example, when you describe millennials as the generation that is cohabiting the most, this is not necessarily due to generational effect. That could be age effect. At the time of the study, most millennials were young adults, and we know that young adults tend to cohabit more than older people. Similarly, when we claim that millennials are the generation with the most people in poverty, that could be due to period effect, to the fact that inequalities have increased, and therefore there are a larger proportion of young people now that are in poverty than they were in the past. It's very easy to confound age, period, and cohort effects. Even the excellent economics explained seem to forget to point out the differences in this video. So now that we've discussed the fact that we need to distinguish between those age, period, and cohort effect, what do we really know about them? Well, it seems that in the academic literature on the topic, cohort effect tend to be relatively small when compared to age and period effects. The focus of generation might also mask important differences about how people that are technically from the same generation experience different phases of their life cycle. That could be, for example, because they are from a different ethnicity than the dominant one in their country of origin, or because they are women. This has partially been acknowledged by the Pew Research Center in an article about how they're going to do generational research going forward. In this article, they acknowledge issue with cross-sectional data. They also suggest that they will pay more attention to distinguishing age, period, and cohort effect in the future. For example, if we revisit the five facts about millennials that we covered earlier, we do not necessarily know whether what we observe is due to age, period, or cohort effect. There's also a big chance, based on what we know from the academic literature, that the cohort effects are relatively small compared to the age and period effects. For example, saying that millennials are the generation that's renting the most, some of that could be due to age. They will move out of renting and into owning their own home as they age. But it could also be a period effect. Inequalities have increased and millennials might struggle more moving onto the property ladder than people that were young. Early. The Pew Research Center came up with an article listing five things to keep in mind when thinking about generations. First, generations are not scientifically defined. Second, labels can lead to stereotypes. Third, when we talk about generation, we emphasize differences across different generations, but we often forget considerable similarities across those different generations. Fourth, the way we have studied generation might have an upper class bias in the way we describe the experiences of members of those generations. And fifth, people change over time. Overall, the acknowledgement by Pew and others that generations are diverse is one of the strongest indictment of the popular view of generation. For example, the description of everyone of a certain age as millennials, Gen Z, or boomers. This doesn't mean that we cannot find differences between people born in different decades. But we need to be careful before we attribute those differences to cohort effect to try to account for age and period effect. We also need to keep in mind that based on what we already know about cohort effect, they tend to be small in many cases. The end of the article by Pew on their revised view of generations is very telling. They say, and I quote, Our audiences should not expect to see a lot of new research coming out of Pew Research Center 
that uses the generational lens. This is in sharp contrast with the large number of articles about millennials that they've published over the past decade. I hope that you see now that generational labels are to actual generational change as astrology is to your personality. However, there's a deeper conversation going on in the academic literature about whether the idea of generation is a fruitful concept at all. Broadly speaking, there's two groups. There are people who think the generational label are often not very useful, but that the concept of generation and of cohort as its uses, and other people who think that, generally speaking, thinking in terms of generation has not been very fruitful and we should probably avoid doing it. As for my own position, when I started researching this video, I was mostly skeptical about generational labels. But looking into the literature, it seems that very often generational effects are quite small and therefore generations probably matter less than we usually think and they certainly matter a lot less than their portrayal in popular culture would make you believe. The grip of generational labels on the popular imagination probably reveals something quite interesting about the way we think and how we use heuristics in order to make sense of the world around us. But really, talking about heuristics is a topic for another video. One last thing I'd like to leave you with is the idea that maybe the urge of dissing on the youngest generation comes from the fact that we all suffer from the illusion of moral decline. In short, what that is, is the impression that since we were born, the moral quality of people in the world has been constantly declining. Let me leave you with this. Because Boomer are an actual demographic event, it's still okay for you to say, okay, Boomer. Even though if you're not already in your 40s, it's unlikely your parents are actually Boomers. If you like this, check out the video that's appearing here. Bye for now.